Welcome back, or welcome if you're just joining us. This is the France 24 debate. France's Prime Minister, Manuel Valls, uh, putting to Parliament, I guess what you could call a second vote of confidence, two weeks after he became the new PM and his government was approved by the National Assembly, this time to approve his 50 billion euros of belt tightening. It's non-binding, but still he's called it, and I quote, a moment of truth. Where's the talk about it? French Socialist Center, Ellen Conway Mouret, uh, Francesco S uh, Saracino, senior economist at the OFCE, and German entrepreneur Jakob Hassler, co-founder of Tiny Clues. Tell us about Tiny Clues. A big data startup, technology company. Based? In Paris. Based in Paris. Um, the, pr the new prime minister, uh, Manuel Valls, 52 years old, went into the job of prime minister last month from the interior ministry, boasting the highest popularity of any current French politician. His pitch for a yes vote this Tuesday at the National Assembly included letters to opposition MPs to court them and uh, some flamboyant oratio. I'm taking responsibility because this is the choice of future reform that is long overdue. I'm taking responsibility because this is the choice of pride and refound optimism that our country needs. I'm taking responsibility because it's the choice of trust. And these choices, let's make them together for France and for the French people. France, ladies and gentlemen, needs your strength to get itself moving. That is why I'm asking for your vote. Votre vote. And then Conway Moy, uh, the, his predecessor, you, as you were saying in part one, you, you were a junior minister in the previous cabinet. Uh, his predecessor often likened to a glorified chief of staff. It's not very fair, but that's how some people uh, qualify Jean-Marc Ayrault. Manuel Valls, as you saw, much more flamboyant there at the, at the rostrum. Uh, is it change? Is it signal a change as well for France's institutions? The fact that you have this prime minister who's much more out there. Well, it's a French. Well, it, it's a different style, of course, different personality. But uh, I think the same commitment. I worked with Jean-Marc Ayrault for two years, nearly two years, and uh, he was extremely solid. Uh, he was applying the program that François Hollande was elected on. A good foot on. soldier. Sorry. A good foot soldier. Uh, yes, but you were talking about chief of staff, so from a soldier he made up, <laughs> up in grade and he was prime minister. Uh, he was a very solid man and uh, I think what I said previously, but I'm not going to repeat myself, he laid the foundation for what can be done. Uh, it's a five-year term that uh, the president Hollande was elected on. Um, in the first two years, um, there was the catching up with what had been done before, the debt exploded in five years. I mean, we just have to look at figures. And when we arrived, what we had to do is to try to stabilize the situation. Unemployment, which uh, was a priority for the president. Youth, putting a lot of uh, means on education and again, trying to work on that and, and, and reducing youth unemployment in particular. So we did all of that, and I think what uh, Manuel Valls is capable of doing now is, is presenting his pack and say, well, now there are three years left to the end of the mandate, and we need to have met the objectives that were set but we heard in, that in clip, the campaign. But we heard in that clip him saying, I take responsibility, uh, which there's been the impression, both under Nicolas Sarkozy's tenure and under the first two years of François Hollande, that, well, the really big decisions are being made not at the government level, but at the top, at the presidential palace. Is that really, is that going to Yes, but Emmanuel Valls is in charge of the government. And I think, you know, he's very When much he says, I take responsibility, is it true? Well, he was the one that was engaging his own responsibility somehow today, and that's the way he felt about it, because I was in the Senate this morning and I heard him uh, talking to the socialist group, and that's the way he felt himself. He, he, he's in charge of a, of a government that's putting in place the uh, roadmap that the president was elected on. And he wants to meet the objectives. And he is a figure of authority as well, which I think is needed in France today. I think uh, the French like a figure that is strong, that uh, gives the roadmap that, you know, we're talking about changing of, uh, le changement de cap, you know, changing of- A change of course. Of course. But 
I think the French people don't like changing courses all the time. They just want to know where they're going. They want to know why they're making savings, why they have to make all these sacrifices, and where this is leading them. And that's what Manuel Valls is doing in the way he's presenting himself. He's in charge of that team. He has objectives that he wants to meet, and therefore, he needs the vote of the parliament and he needs the support. And that's what he was doing today. Uh, a, a popular uh, interior minister, uh, firebrand speaker. Some are likening that to Nicolas Sarkozy, who uh, was interior minister and became very popular doing so. Yes, but Manuel Valls, I think, is a, board, a bit more calm and uh, a bit more focused on the objectives that are not going to be changing from day to day the way it was in the past. With is the message getting across better, Jakob? I think the message is getting across better, but I have to say, of course, you can't say it any other way. But to me, it seems that after two years, we're actually exactly like under the Sarkozy government. So in that sense, Sarkozy and Hollande actually share that. They just thought, like everyone in France has always thought, that as soon as growth picks up, there will be enough momentum for, for the time being Get that the problems to some extent solve themselves. You solve the public finance problem by increasing some taxes. And it turns out this doesn't work. So today we're at the back to the wall. And in the end, there's only one way out or, you know, there are several ways out. But one of the ways out is the one that France has now chosen with the prime minister, fresh blood, who embodies this and has always called for it. But I think it's, uh, it's in that sense a crucial moment it, they don't have a real choice, but if they go and it works, it could have been a defining moment. But time will tell how defining today's vote will have been, assuming it goes through. Francesco Sancino? I have to, no, I have to kind of repeat what I said before. I don't think a real radical change of policy here. I, uh, and I'm not talking about France per se, I'm talking about uh, uh, the fact that France once again gives up its role to try to change and inflect a little bit uh, European policies. And uh, what view do you have to Manuel Valls? Sorry? What do you think of Manuel Valls? Well, I, on that I share your opinion. Let's wait and see. Uh, he was very active in the Ministry of Interior, with some people saying lots of communication, very little results. I think this is a bit unfair. I think uh, uh, he had a good record there. Um, he has to be tested. And also his capacity to interact with the president, because, I mean, when, when as you said before, he takes responsibility, but the, the, the French system doesn't allow the prime minister to take responsibility beyond a certain point. So. If he goes beyond that, it, we will have to see what happens with François Hollande. We have to see what happens if in 2017 he decides that he wants to run for something bet better than Prime Minister. But that is... Let's wait and see. Let's wait and see. My, my, my point is that the first acts of this government are very similar to the, to the acts of the other government. In, in his speech, by the way, today, Valls are making the point that uh, the president would go to Brussels and ask for a conversation on the strength of the euro, too strong, according to, to Manuel Valls. Is that a change? And do you see that as being realistic? That is something that comes periodically. It's, uh, it's a typical... Uh, French obsession. It's a French... Uh, not only. It's a, it's a Competitive devaluation <laughs> is a French obsession. Yeah, exactly. I'm Italian, so, I mean, we, yeah. are, we, we have been experts <laughs> well, you, of that. It's not good for exports. I mean, no, I'm, not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm when not you saying see that the euro... Britain has done pretty well by having a pound that's undervalued mm -hmm. compared to the euro. The yeah, British too. industry has the British industry been saved? Is Japan the model for industrial growth? I don't know. There's always a question about the long term and the short term effect. Yes, all else equal, it's always better if what you produce costs twenty percent less today, if that were possible. And yes, of course, if you could without any costs, just lower your uh, your uh, your exchange rate. Of course, you should be doing it. Deus ex machina. The unfortunate thing is, is that there is no Deus ex machina that can produce that just like that. So that, that is the real problem. So I'm not at all opposed to the idea that the euro is maybe overvalued, but the question is what are the structural levers to address these questions about the balance of exchange rate in the, in the world globally? 
I, I tend to agree. I tend to agree. The, these, but I mean, it, it's related with the labor costs somehow. This obsession with price adjustments that everybody has. We, ca we just have to reduce our price and then we will export our way out of the crisis. This can happen through easy ways, which is the depreciation of the exchange rate. Italy in the 70s and 80s proved that this, in the end, is catastrophic. It can happen through the with the German model of compressing costs and wages and exporting their way out of, of any crisis. But it doesn't solve this substantial problem. The substantial problem is that an healthy economy is an economy in which there is a balance between demand and supply. Uh, the, in this respect, the German economy is much less healthier than people believe. The German economy is far too dependent on exports for its growth. And I'm afraid that we are transforming all the other European uh, countries, because uh, today Germany is in the short run, as you said, is very successful. We are transforming all the European countries in Germany. But if all the European countries are Germany, what happens <coughs> then <coughs> is that we will have nowhere to export. And that I, is the problem. And that, that is so, so true only because when you look at the balance of trade of Germany versus EU, it's about equal. When you look at the, the value of goods Germany exports to the EU and it imports from the EU, they're about the same value. Where Germany has been good is in the exporting of the new of Asian markets and of, you know, and exploiting those market opportunities, which to me don't seem so much to be constrained by cost. It's not cost that blocks you from delivering high quality goods to China. It's not cost. It's not a question of the German labor cost that has any impact on, I don't know, machine tools that are exported at high prices to China. So Whereas to Europe, there is a balance of goods exported to Europe and imported from Europe. When you look at it between Germany, it's, it's about even. All right. And it brings us back to the question of belt tightening. Uh, many on the left of the Socialist Party staying away uh, from the vote this Tuesday or saying that they would abstain. I don't want cleaned up public finances with sluggish growth, but nor do I want to kill spending, households purchasing power or public investment in local regions. He said, I don't want to die healthy, and, uh, the, uh, uh, that socialist MP who is, who is abstaining. He is on the left of the party. Um, how tough a sell is this going to be to your constituents? I think we just need to use a little bit more uh, pedagogy to explain what's being done, uh, why it's being done, and what are the objectives and what we want to do, what we want to reach. Um, people, I think, are very attached, French people are very attached to their social model, social security model. Um, there are certain things that we need to protect, and therefore we need to find savings in the other quarters. And once we do that, I think the French will be accepting what's being presented. But as you say, the French, and this is something perhaps foreigners don't always understand, expect a lot from the state. They expect a lot. They from do, the yeah. It's a cultural thing. And uh, we can see it even abroad, because I was in foreign affairs for the past two years. and. Uh, when um, we offer uh, protection to French citizens, which is unequaled uh, by any other country, uh, what we call consular protection, uh, anybody abroad who runs into trouble can turn to its embassies or her embassy and uh, find support and so on. So it's, uh, it's a reflex that French people have. They turn to the state. They expect a lot. They expect a lot from their public services. And if we are serious about continuing to uh, offer high quality public services, well, we need to make some readjustments. And uh, that's why, apart from the fact de simplification and so on, we, um, we have engaged in, in those structural reforms that need to modernize uh, the whole system, find safe time, make it more effective, and um, protect that quality of public service that uh, they're accustomed to. I mean, it, it, it's quite uh, amazing when and I do travel a, a lot abroad uh, to see French people criticizing the TGV when it's three minutes late. And in other countries, well, you wait for an hour for a train and it just, you know, people are just used to that and, and they don't criticize as much. But uh, it's part of the French way of being. You mentioned the TGV. It's built by uh, Alstom. 
And uh, there's been a saga this week here in France, the French engineering giant, uh, in a plan to sell off its uh, energy uh, portion of its activity, 70% of its activities, to the American GE uh, on the subject of Alstom suitors, the German rival Siemens weighing in now. The state no longer a shareholder, but it gets back to what we were saying about how the uh, French voters expect <clears throat> a lot from the state. And it does say it's a stakeholder. So when news broke last week that GE had put $13 billion on the table, well, the economy minister weighed in. The government. With this deal, the French government will demonstrate patriotic vigilance, and their decision will be inspired by the greatness of French industry. Arnaud Montbourg, and it's a bit of a double act, is it not, in France? You have, uh, on the one hand, the reformist prime minister, and on the other hand, the economy minister, who's sort of this left-wing, uh, more to the left of the, of the party. I'm not sure that they're actually the, the, the state will actually be able to do much in this, except uh, some moral suasion. I mean, we saw with the, with the much, as you said before, on a much smaller scale with the telecom uh, uh, Vivendi operation. I mean, in the end, uh, this is not something the government can have too much to say about. And maybe this is good news. What is rather worrisome is that uh, you don't see, and this is very different from Germany, and I tend to agree with you, it has nothing to do with cost of labor and that this is the strength of Germany. You don't see any uh, clear vision of an industrial policy for the country here. We, we go on a case-by-case -case, uh, uh, assessment and we try to... To solve at, this, at the start of the year, we heard the French president say he'd like to see a Franco-German energy giant. That would be very good. That would be very good. The problem is, as you said before in the introduction, that this may risk costing lots of jobs. So, so, but but it, it, it's true that uh, many commentators say that it would be nice to have a sort of uh, Airbus model applied to uh, electric industries. And but the problem is that you have very short, very high short-term costs, and these are very hard to bear politically. No, sorry. No, it's just that, that when the government does so much for companies that you expect uh, in return at least to be told what's happening. And for Buig, for instance, uh, who is getting a lot of support uh, from the government and has been for the past two years uh, for the minister to realize on the Friday that, you know, the deal was done and that the company was being but sold I, on I, Sunday. Absolutely, I'm not saying I think, I'm, you know, saying it's, it's, it's a matter of trust. I mean, one cannot just put 30 billion on the table and say we're lowering the labor costs, we are giving all that support and, uh, and at the end of the day there's nothing in return. So it's, it's, it's uh, I think it's a matter Sorry, of trust I, I uh, between the companies. I, I, I agree with you. I agree with you that there is a problem of reciprocity. I mean, the, the, the problem is that once this doesn't happen, the government has in the end very little leverage. And uh, that is the problem. I'm, I'm not saying it's fair. I totally agree with you that a government that has very strong s level of support of the French industries should have in return some uh, consideration in industrial choices, which doesn't mean necessary. Mm -hmm. But uh, if that doesn't happen, it happened with Vivendi and Wig, and it, I'm afraid, will happen also with Alstom. There is very little they can do, and uh, maybe and maybe less today they're, they're ready to do. Then let's not forget who saved courageously Alstom with in energetic interventions of his friends at Bouygues and be going to Brussels and imposing all these things to Mario Monti at the time. It was Nicolas Sarkozy who was a minister and he was always claimed that he saved Alstom. The problem obviously is that that was a sh typical short-term measure that did save Alstom at the moment, but what did it do? It got Alstom an investor who doesn't know whether he's a public building company, a telephone company, or an industrial conglomerate with 30 odd percent or 29 percent. And obviously it's very unclear how all of this plays out. And it's just that the noyau d'actionnaire of these companies, if you think they're strategic industries for the state, and that you can be UMP or a socialist or whatever, at least when you're in France, everybody would agree that the state, most people would agree that the state has a role in there. Now, I don't think not necessarily as much, 
But once you take that for granted, then you just have to observe that there was a t total failure of establishing a strong shareholdership of Alstom. And so today you have, you're faced with a situation where the state has no money, where the state has no legitimacy, and where you happen to have, in addition, this problem of trust, which is a very delicate, it's a very delicate situation because obviously there have been talks between Siemens and the senior management of Alstom as well. It's just that, they, that Siemens was rebuked for whatever reason. People say there were personal reasons that they don't like each other. Right, and, and that GE is just a better fit between the leaders. But then, you know, as we always know, the leaders who leave a company that is being sold also act, you know, they have... And like we were talking about reforms, uh, the street credibility, if you were, of the French government, perhaps at stake with this saga that's ongoing and which is still unfolding uh, as we speak. Uh, a couple of uh, uh, your uh, remarks. Uh, uh, reforms, says Tom Look at Montbourg, the economy minister you heard just a moment ago. He totally rejects many free enterprise ideals. So it seems to be uh, this view that there's this dissonance within the French government between the reformists, that it's not a double act, that they're in fact speaking at cross purposes. The reformers on the one hand <clears throat> and uh, those that are like Arnaud Montbourg. No, everybody is a reformist today. I mean, as I say, there's no You say they're singing no from the same hymn sheet? Well, with, uh, no, with different voices. Uh, uh, there's a soprano, and I'm not too sure what Arnaud <laughs> Bonvo would be there in, in the choir. But, the diva, that's uh, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, Arnaud Bonvo has his own voice, but uh, I think he's proving his engagement uh, towards the companies. He knows every single, if you listen to the question d'actualité, uh, he knows every single small company that uh, is, is, is really going to work to save jobs for the past two years and uh, he may have his own, his own way of saying things but uh, I think he is also coming around to having this patriotic All right. and we'll uh, certainly kind of be hearing, economy. And, as we say, so we'll certainly be hearing more of him uh, as this story unfolds, uh, our The Economy Minister, Eden Conway Murray, I want to thank you. I want to thank as well Jakob Hasler and Francesco uh, Saracino. Before we say goodbye, though, uh, we've been talking about strong personalities and Montpour obviously is not the strongest. Let's say hello to James Creedon, does our you media well. watch a segment. The man uh, who, uh, who says, I take responsibility in that yes, speech yes, at the National yes. Assembly is the new Prime Minister, Manuel Valls. That's right, and uh, a lot of criticism for, uh, for, for Manuel Valls in the media today. Let's take a look at a couple of articles and elements on social media talking about that. Manuel Valls, is he right-wing enough? Now, this is an article in Le Monde. Now, what's interesting is here is... is the French broadsheet of record. That's right, and they're saying, look, this isn't comparable to Blairism because during the Tony Blair years in the UK, uh, hundreds of thousands of jobs were created in the health sector, in the education sector, whereas we're going the opposite direction here in France. This is more comparable to uh, the policies of Thatcher or Cameron. And seeing, uh, so for, for this article in Le Monde, it, there is no question, he, it is a right-wing policy. And is it even a right, a good right-wing policy? Is, mm. it, is it a coherent right-wing policy? So that's actually the, the, the discussion in this article. We know it's right wing. Is it even a good right wing set of policies? If you go to Liberation, the main uh, paper of the left, uh, this is a, a pretty damning article by, uh, uh, by two left wing thinkers saying, would a right wing government even have dared such a set of policies? And I'll give you a translation of just the beginning of that article. The pill is bitter and big, so hard to swallow that it's lodging in the throat. We are the disappointed members of the Socialist Party who every day see our dream uh, evaporate. And the Socialist Party, there is no internal debate. It hasn't just fallen asleep. It has frozen up since the 6th of May 2012. So essentially, they're really disenchanted. The day François Hollande was elected. That's right. So uh, you can see, you're getting a sense there of the tone. Now, despite that, there, was a, there were quite a few rhetorical flourishes from the Prime Minister in uh, yeah, when he said, Parliament I take responsibility, today. it's j'assume in French. J'assume, oui, j'assume. Which is now a hashtag. I which see. has become a hashtag on social media. I take responsibility for the choices that were made. And it was like a refrain where he went on for a number of minutes saying, I take responsibility for this, for the coherency, for the courage, etc., etc. So a lot of people uh, commenting on how that was very similar to a speech made by uh, François Hollande during the presidential debate, the now infamous I, pre as President of the Republic speech, moi, Président de la République, where he too listed off 
I as president will do this, I as president will do that. And years down the line now, well, 18 months down the line, it's being used as a sort of a, uh, a, 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 what would you say, something to compare his policies with. It even has its own Wikipedia page, Moi Président de la République. So some are saying, is, is, it, is this going to be the new Moi Président speech where years down the line, it, your policies are going to be compared to this speech? Perhaps not All always. Right. A rhetorical advice to use at your own peril. Then. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> now, also in terms of cartoons, uh, whether it be on social media or in, in newspapers, an awful lot of people having a go at uh, the Prime Minister who has Spanish origins, and here he's being cast as a matador knifing all of these uh, uh, Socialist Party dissenting uh, you know, members. No, they seem to be <laughs> managing it. And here, uh, Rose is being brandished in the air, but also Manuel Valls, instead of being sort of given the, the birthday bumps, he's being punched, it seems. So look, certainly for who was, a man who was the most popular minister, he's getting a rough ride within the Socialist Party at the moment. Uh, but of course, the truth will be, uh, when there's that vote in the National Assembly, I want to thank you, James Creed. That's right, we'll see. You'll, you'll be following it as it <laughs> unfolds. I want to thank our panel. And thank you for being with us here in the France 24 today.